Welcome back to this IoT course. And today we are discussing in the second lecture uh, more about IoT applications and devices. And giving this some sort of second lecture in two parts, so there will be uh, lectures two and three, focusing on the IoT applications and also uh, devices. In this first part of this lecture, uh, I'm just talking more about the personal smart devices. And in the second part or in the third lecture, I'm talking more about the public spaces uh, and uh, this kind of like a public IoT. But first, we are focusing on personal smart devices, especially those we carry on, such as smartphones. And uh, we have to say that smartphones are the most, best, mostly or, or the best known IoT devices in the world because they are highly penetrated in the communities. It means that most of the people, not most, but quite many people, at least in the Western countries, use them. And uh, they have become kind of like a de facto carry-on device everybody has. And um, it's some, sometimes not that clear to call the smartphones or IoT devices, but they do have. And they are especially important for controlling other devices. So, because these are designed for UI purposes. They are designed for to be usable by the user. And, and they are easy to uh, connect, for example, to other devices like smart home applications when you usually have an application in a smartphone uh, and, and based, on, uh, based on that smartphone application, you can control the other devices in your home. That's the kind of most general, general setting. However, these devices, they are quite powerful. They do have a quite reasonable CPU and GPU power already. So, and, and they have a fast networking capability. They, they are, in terms of networking, they are like a full computers. They can connect the TCP IP, uh, any internet protocols fully, but they do also have a different communication protocols available like a Bluetooth, um, Wi Fi, and so on. So, uh, yes, the smartphones are here and they are a very important part of IoT. Of course, not the only personal device. But the biggest issue with the smartphones are that they are battery dependent, meaning that you have to have a, a certain knowledge of how the battery, uh, battery energy efficiency on smartphones are coming, just to keep sure that you are by running certain uh, applications, you are not using all the battery of the user device. Um, they are also highly personal, meaning that they are always carry on with you, means that they collect highly personal data and that sets some boundaries for privacy thinking, security thinking, also ethical questions, how much data we can collect from these devices, how we can use the device, uh, data collected from these devices and what reasonable things we can expect the user to agree when we are uh, discussing about such an uh, important devices everywhere carried on, uh, used for different purposes. Um, as mentioned, so smartphones are really uh, sensor devices. So they do have a lot of uh, different sensors uh, implemented by uh, the actual hardware. Of course, this varies a lot by manufacturer. It varies by whether it's Android device, which Android device from which company, iPhone devices are different, so that we do have a little bit smaller uh, manufacturers available. So it it's doesn't always guarantee that you do actually have a uh, common sensor, uh, even if the API has that. And this is especially for all the Android developers, always check whether this sensor is actually supported by your model. Um, let's say like a usual general Samsung devices do or, uh, support for most of the IAP features, but of course, if you have some smaller manufacturer, you need to check. And whenever we are considering smartphones, so they are meant to be user devices. They're meant to be cheap, not cheap in terms of uh, bad quality always, but they are meant to be in a price range that um, at least someone <laughs> on the market space wants to uh, buy. So, so that these are uh, consumer devices in every uh, term of, <coughs> um, responsibility. So if you even have, for example, have like a healthcare application based on smartphone sensing only, you need to remember it's not a medical device. It's, it's a stock on market device you, uh, sold for a different purpose than uh, the application is actually meant for. It means that 
uh, different questions about data quality. Can we really sense the things we want to sense from the smartphone data? Uh, how we can transfer the data, where to transfer the data, where to manage the data, lots of questions really arise from the smartphone. Uh, smartphone environment. And of course, because they're carrying devices, as mentioned, you carry it on everywhere you go, and basically these can be tracked for you every moment, technically. Where you live, where you work, what you do, between where you go to shopping. So, so these are very highly, highly private devices. So of course, users want to have different applications, users want to have different purpose of uh, sensing available, those are also useful, but we need to also consider how much information we really need to gather from those devices and, and um, what we do for those uh, sensor data yeah, available on, on, on those devices. Can we trust it, how we need to process it, how we can make it reliable, how we can make it personal and secure. These sort of questions are rising in smartphone uh, sensing all the time. These are very important in, in, in this context. <clears throat> so as mentioned, the smartphones do have a lot of different sensors available. Why I'm speaking about the smartphones here is that those are quite easy to understand for everyday life because most of us are using them anyway. But these similar sensing technologies are also used in different devices, different embedded devices, um, different uh, from the size of uh, auto, the car, uh, autonomous vehicles to the smallest to robotics, we can have a location sensor. But that's useful to understand it through the smartphone context. So we have a different um, uh, ways to sense the location of the user or the device itself. Uh, GPS, well known. If you don't know what's GPS, check it immediately on Google. Uh, Wi-Fi access points and cell signals can be the network uh, capability around us can also be used to whether to support the GPS or, or operate as an individual uh, uh, location uh, uh, infrastructure. But of course, those are for outdoor sensing. So uh, GPS is not very good working inside, of course, because you don't have that connection. Uh, Wi-Fi access points can operate inside, but if you want to locate someone in terms of in which room in the building he or she is, then you need to consider specialized interlocalization technologies, and there are multiple ones. It can be based on, on the Wi-Fi, whether the Wi-Fi access point locations or Wi-Fi signals from the room walls. <coughs> it can be based on the microphone, different echoes, cameras, and stuff like that. So there are, this is a big research area on itself, how to locate people inside the buildings. Different tags can be used for uh, infrareds uh, to get information who is coming and going on the rooms. So indoor localization is, is a big topic. Outdoor localization is, cannot say solved, but it, it's the easier, easier case immediately. And then most of the devices, not every, every device, but quite rare, many devices actually also have the magnetometer, which can be used as a compass. Then we have a positioning, and these two uh, sensors are very well mostly used for, at least in different student projects, because these are quite easy to understand. Accelerometer and gyroscope, and both of them are giving a three coordinate location of the position of the device. So it's, it's position the actual device is in, in your hand. And they can be used either separately or, or together, and usually for step counters, um, uh, augmented reality where you need to know in which direction the user is actually looking at or, or in what's the position of the device itself, whether it's in horizontal or vertical, changing the uh, screen size is actually one of these, well, where we use these. Different sport applications use these sensors and, 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 and these are kind of very well utilized. Also a huge research area, how and when and where these should be or could be used. <coughs> then we do have a light and temperature sensors. Nowadays, most smartphones mainly have the inside temperature sensor, meaning that it tells you the battery temperature, not the ambient temperature or the outside temperature. But if you consider any embedded systems, these sort of like temperature, humidity, um, air quality sensors are mainly different sensing the uh, temperature, stuff like that. Uh, so even the smartphones usually have some sort of light proximity sensors or something 
to detect whether this phone is facing your, your head here or, or not, whether it's in a dark room or not, to, for example, adjust the screen brightness. But these are very easy, uh, kind of like common sensors in most of the IoT, home IoT settings and, and, and stuff like that. So yes, we do have these sort of sensors. And then, of course, smartphones are very complex systems. And we do have different user settings. We have a different knowledge of the network capabilities. We have different networks available, network information. And those information can also be used to do different things to, for example, predict the smartphone energy usage or predict the smartphone lifetime or predict the smartphone capabilities to operate in different computational environments. So also these are usually available through the API, but of course, like everything, especially in Android, depends heavily on, on, on how the API is actually implemented in, in that version. Mobile applications, this is just, um, not that common to think about, that we can use the applications to sense something, but yes, we can sense what the user is doing on the smartphone. Certain applications are used only when you are traveling. Certain applications are used only when you're working, studying, or staying at home. There is the common knowledge that, for example, most of the games are mainly played evening time, different sort of things. We can individualize or, or, or find out who is the user based on which applications they are using. So these are also giving out very personal, individual information, how you are behaving, what you are doing, what things you see important, What's your everyday life like? This is, this is where we can utilize the application, use its information. And it reveals a lot about the user itself. So this is also very privacy sensitive data to be collected uh, in any case. And of course, talking about the privacy, we go even higher to privacy risks, including cameras, microphones, um, a different um, these kind of like a sensors that have like a direct impact on your environment. So these are also, of course, for surveillance purposes, things like that. These are good, but uh, you need to consider whether you can do the same thing actually without having the camera and microphone information collected. Whether there would be some other option like using the accelerometer or something else for doing the same application. <laughs> but okay, switching to the wearables. So when speaking about the wearables, we usually um, uh, the mean and some devices which we and carry on in our personal space or they have a skin contact. They can be different smart watches. We are on, on your wrist, wrist pants, for, uh, for example, uh, or bracelets, for example, fitness trackers, smart rings and, and different sort of uh, devices. And, and what we, these are used for <laughs> especially for healed care uh, information. Your blood pressure, your skin's electrical conductivity, heart rate can be measured by skin conductivity sensors. And, and then those very basic ac um, uh, accelerometer, gyroscope information can be used, for example, you're tracking your steps and, and counting what you are doing and recognizing the environment you are based on, on the accelerometer curves. <clears throat> so, but those devices are usually, because they are smaller in space, in, in physical space, you need to consider what's inside in that. Usually smaller batteries, they don't have a UI, they don't have a direct user interface. It means that they need to be connected to usually the smartphone and, or any other gateway device to become actually interactable with, with the user. So uh, if the screen is very small, there is no screen at all. Usually the data is sent to the smartphone and, and, and via Bluetooth or Bluetooth uh, uh, low energy. And, and that means that uh, then the data can be whether processed on a smartphone, for example, shown to the user on the smartphone screen <coughs> or sent to some back, back end service for computation and analyzing and, and, and things like that. Uh, so you usually these devices are, because they are carry on, they are connected via very low range uh, protocol like Bluetooth to uh, the devices, same user is using. 
But of course, the same applies here. <coughs> I already mentioned about the smartphone sensing. These are not medical devices. So when you are measuring something like a blood pressure, you always need to take into account that the accuracy of the measurement may not be as good as using the actual medical purpose device. Medical purpose device here means it's accepted and patented to be, or be a medical device. And most of the Stockholm devices are not in that level, but they can do something else. They can uh, easily track your steps and give you successes about your everyday um, sport activities. So this is easy. But don't make medical diagnosis based on smartphone collected data or smartwatch collected data, please. This is about the first electrical sensing. I'm a little bit going ahead of my topic. So yes, physical, physiological sensing, we mean that we are uh, interested in the user's uh, stress, sleep quality, workload, cognitive load, what the user is doing, how stressful it is. <coughs> Such an information, yes, it can be collected from uh, the personal devices, which are not medical devices, but then we need to consider the accuracy of the data outcome. But for example, giving the information uh, about the stress level, uh, we need to consider very uh, how the personal physical reactions differ from each other. So uh, especially the stress, sensing the stress. Uh, people are reacting in stressful situations very differently. Some people became immediately red on their face but, and get uh, sweetie, but some people doesn't have like any physical reaction. Also, how we feel the stress, which level is too stressful for us, it differs person by person. It also means that when we are learning for when the person is stressed, we need to consider these are very personal factors. And any machine learning algorithm need to be considered so that these models are highly, highly personal. But yeah, this is a very interesting topic. This is very ongoing a research area where we are all the time getting new devices, new sensors, getting new ideas how to sense these better machine learning methods, better trainings. And so this is very in, in important and interesting uh, area, how we can augment a healthcare, for example, to everyday devices. <coughs> Then this is a less known, so it's clothing and different fabrics that are made smart. And usually those are directly on your skin. It's like a second skin. And these you can, because you have a, like a bigger area of skin uh, conductivity than actual own bracelet or ring, you can get the sense readings from the whole area of the skin. And there are applications, especially for people making professional sports or professional athletics, use these other devices, but they're not very common in general market yet. Yes, for fashion purposes, there have been uh, dresses showing up lights, dresses having changing images on, on the fabric. So these can be done. But of course, uh, it's a fashion, but the usability of such an, uh, systems is not always that's great because if it's a cloth, you need to wash it, for example, and washing electronics is an open question, how to do that. But yeah, these are, are more or less around how important, how, how, how um, common they will became, it's open question. And uh, important thing here, everybody kind of accepts the smartphones or fitness trackers and usability of those but as a fashion item, a smartificated cloth, is it a part of it? So when discussing about things that are made smart, we always need to kind of ask, is it this really reasonable? So are we getting things smart only because it sounds cool? Or is it something that adds the experience of the user? Does it add information for the user, something which is beneficial and something which is uh, uh, actually reasonable. Uh, so not all smart solutions are actually quite smart. You can call smart uh, things that are not learning anything, which are not connected to global internet, which are not accepted kind of like a, in, in technical terms, really be smart but it's, it's kind of 
common that you put an electronics to something and you call it smart and then it sells better. So always put a little bit of consideration. What actually is smart? It's supposed to have communication, supposed to uh, be learning something, for example, the, from the user behavior, supposed to do something fit with uh, fits in general uh, kind of augments or increases uh, the original purpose of the item. Then, then we can call it smart. <clears throat> okay, so uh, summary from this lecture, we have discussed a lot of personal devices, especially smartphones, and covered some of the common sensors also available in smartphones, but also uh, included in many embedded system embedded sensors. Uh, one, some things to consider, for example, about the smartphones, even if us are feeling like everybody's using them, if there are people who are not for different reasons using these devices, for example, elder people or small kids. So we cannot say that, okay, this covers the whole population, but it's, it's well penetrated, that we can say. And the wearables, different physical sensors are nice, but they used to be quite expensive. So uh, in the price of, for example, smart ring, you can actually get a quite reasonable smartphone. So we cannot say that these are well penetrated in the communities, uh, because there is this economical issue, people may not be available getting those devices at all. And whenever we are col collecting data, managing data on IoT devices, which are highly personal, carry on devices very close to your skin, close to your everyday life, close to your location, even, then we need to consider security, privacy, and ethical questions. Which data collection is reasonable? How we manage the data? Do we really? need the data and what is the purpose of the data collection can we give something for the user which is actually useful thanks for coming to this lecture the next lecture will consider uh, smart homes public spaces and a little bit about the industry and autonomous vehicles thank you